please welcome Marty O'Donnell. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody. I'm glad you're here. You've all had lunch. It's not time to have a nap. It's time to listen to this talk. Uh, I'm going to split my time with my trusty audio design dude named Ian Shores, who was a student here at DigiPen when I taught a, a one semester of a, of a class, and Ian was a, a rock star. He, be, he came to work for me, and now he's full-time at Highwire Games. Also, he's found other people from DigiPen to work for us, like Nick, the programmer, and uh, how, Andrew. So how many do we have now from DigiPen? Four? Three, three like modern DigiPen. Plus there's you. Yeah, and then that's there's four. some older people, too. Oh, that's true. But What's they weren't name my dude. They weren't, I know. So DigiPen, we are extremely happy this is here, and we are glad to poach your students. Um, so here's my laser pointer. This is my sunset. Brian had a sunset, but this island is not uh, whatever his island is, Mercer. This is Whidbey Island, and this is not a lake. This is Puget Sound. So that's the difference in the, our sunset views. Just wanted to get that clear. Um, yeah, so Highwire Games is the name of the studio. I'm going to go through really quick what this is. Highwire was founded. It's an independent studio, and it's founded by industry veterans, and we average 20 years' experience. Um, luckily, now that we have the, <laughs> the DigiPen guys there, our average has gone way down, so we feel younger, which is great. Um, we've worked on a lot of sort of what I would call bleeding-edge technology games. Like, we've, we, we, we were an Xbox One launch title, which meant that there was a lot of stuff happening that we were hoping would happen. We weren't sure it was going to happen. Uh, even just bringing a first-person shooter to a console was, uh, took some doing. And the guy who really worked hard on the controls of that was a guy named Jamie Griesmer. He's our creative director and lead designer. He and I have been friends forever. And uh, it's great to work with him. Uh, the other guy, the technical director, Jared Knopfel, founded, uh, Knopfel founded Airtight Studios. And he's, uh, he's got a great uh, a bunch of people who are engineers. And he's always looking for more engineers. We also are always looking for more engineers. Um, so we, as a team, have done all these games, or worked on these games, Halo, Destiny, Half-Life, Second Son. Uh, it's just, it's, it's an amazing team. Fifth Cell, we also have guys from there. Halo, Destiny, Half-Life, Infamous, these are all huge AAA titles. Now we have this small independent studio, we're doing small independent things, which is a really, really big change for us, and we love it. So we're trying to bring sort of AAA production techniques to an independent studio that has very little money, which is fun. Uh, so obviously, we ended up being a PlayStation 4 uh, PSVR exclusive title. That's what Golem is. But we started working on VR right at the beginning, right when the first uh, Oculus Kickstarter systems were going out. We had guys working with, with that. Uh, one of our programmers worked with all the early stuff. He was an early Kickstarter um, contributor for Oculus. <clears throat> so we've been working, we've been wanting to know what is it like to actually make a real game in VR. And there haven't been a lot of games out, especially four years ago, there were no real games out there in VR. And now there are some, but we had, er I, it's funny, it says, um, well it doesn't say here, but at some point we said early mindshare. Uh, it's, it's not that early anymore, but we're, we're still okay, because we haven't shipped yet, but not a whole lot of compelling VR games have shipped yet, so we still have a chance of being hopefully in that first swath of games that are early games. So the name of the game that we're making is Golem, and it is a f it's a game about an endless city. It's a small cast of characters. There's You play as a, as a young kid who has an older sister named Sky, and your, your father is alone. He's lost his wife. You're in this sort of desert-type city, and eventually you, your s older sister teaches you how to control golems, which are either could be the size of a doll this big, and you run on the floor, run around on the floor like that, or 10-foot tall stone giant golems that are made out of stone and clay, and you have giant swords, and you hit other golems. So that's a spoiler alert, is some of the other golems are bad, just so you know. 
but, but the fun thing about this game in VR especially is, is that you, everything is one to one. Like when a golem swings his sword at you, you don't just push a button on your controller. You actually have to use your move controller and hold your sword up here. If you hold it here, it will hit your head. If you block the side, it will hit your shoulder. You have to block like real sword play. And I have thrown my shoulder out several times <laughs> actually playing through the game because it gets pretty fast. Um, here's just a, a little video of some of our stuff. And I want you to watch this. This is early content, beta content. You can crank this up, somebody. from about two years ago. nice thing about doing music, uh, prequel music, is that then you have music you can use for trailers. So that was music from Echoes of the First Dreamer, which is some of the prequel music I did for Golem. And some of this music, of course, will also be in the game. Uh, you notice when you saw that crystal in front of you, that's when you're a doll, you're holding a little crystal. When you're a golem, you hold a sword or several other kind of weapons. Um, the hard thing about doing a talk on VR is that I can't show you or have you hear what it feels like to be VR on a 2D flat screen standing here. These speakers are not gonna let you know what VR actually is. Um, because VR is going to be all headphones, completely immersed, HRTF, and it totally works, just like Brian was saying. It completely works, everything is perfectly spatialized, you know exactly where everything is. At least that's what I thought would happen. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what's it like to make audio for VR, how successful it actually is, and some of the tricks you have to do in order to make it cool, even if the technology is not doing everything you hoped it would do. So the first thing I wanna talk to you about is, is just, well, first thing I wanna talk about is, I have a, some, someday I'm gonna write a book called The Rule of Threes, because I feel like just about everything can be put into groups of three. Every rules, I, set of rules I have, I have three rules. When it comes to like, I mean, even Brian talked about it today with uh, piano and forte and then mezzo. I mean, I would never use mezzo piano and mezzo forte. Those are too smushy in the middle. It's like the soft, medium, loud. That's the three. And for velocity, it's like, you know, fast, medium, slow. And for, um, hardnesses of surfaces, it's soft, medium, hard. And once you have enough things like that, rules of three, it's so interesting how those threes can fit together and give you just cover just about everything. Um, so when it comes to like rules for developing games, I have uh, three rules. So here's my three rules for game audio, and this goes for every game I've ever made. Number one, first, do no annoying. Now the reason this is important is because the most annoying thing in a game almost always is an audio thing. <laughs> it's really sad, but I think you can be so annoyed by audio, and as a creator of audio, if you're the one who actually made the annoying thing, you just feel horrible. So first thing always, when you're listening to whatever you're doing, don't do something annoying. Number two, sound makes it real, music makes you feel. This seems self-evident, but it's just something to keep in mind. The th reason things really come to life and they feel like they're real is because you've worked really hard on making the sound work. And we s heard Nick's talk today about 
how he does sound um, and makes those cars come to life. You think about those cars would be just dead without that really important sound. Now, sometimes I think when it comes to sound design, we work ourselves out of a job. The more you stop noticing the sound, the more the sound is just taken for granted. Like, of course that's the way it's supposed to sound. That is really hard to get to the point where people just, it just disappears. Music makes you feel because, I'm sorry, all academic composers, music makes you feel. Uh, music is received by the limbic system in your brain. You're hardwired. It's like sex, drugs, and music all go to the same place. That's a great place to be, by the way, for the brain. <laughs> so just remember that. Music will make you feel. And the third rule is everything that looks like it makes sound makes sound. Okay. How many people are, are veteran sound design people in game business? How many people have built, made and shipped a game where everything you wanted to have make sound made sound? Right. You never get this. This is a, actually, these three things are aspirational. I, I'm not sure I've ever shipped a game where all three of these things ever came true. And I never play a game where I feel like I think all three of these things have just been nailed. Um, Everything that looks like it makes sound, makes sound. That is really hard to do. And it's almost always at the end of the game, the artist threw some, hey, I made an animated shader that we're shipping tomorrow. And I'm like, how does that make sound? I don't even have a way to hook up to that. So it's in the game, silent, doing some cool wavy light thing. And as a matter of fact, when the artist showed it to me, he says, yeah, this cool thing that goes zhroom, zhroom, zhroom. I said, really? Are we shipping you with the game so you can make that sound? <laughs> So I've modified my rules for game audio uh, to include VR. Sound makes it really real. Music still makes you feel. So that's it. That's the modified thing. And the reason for that is that you put those headphones on, and you're actually in this environment where you can look any place you want. You, and in our game, you can actually move any place you want smoothly. You actually just move. Um, and the sound you hear, we know where your eyes are, and we know where your ears are. And one of the things that's really interesting is that you make little moves of the head, and you can actually, like Brian was saying earlier, that you can, that's one of the ways you can sp localize, spatialize sound. You can figure out it's over there. You might not know exactly where it is, but you move your head a little bit, and we know where your ears are, and it, and it shows, it, you can tell that it's there. So, um, now, how do you do cinematics in, in VR? We're going to go through this a little bit. We worked with a company called MoCap Mo Now in Seattle to do cinematics. Um, none of us have done cinematics for VR before. There was no book that I could go read that says, here's how you produce cinematics in VR. So we knew we wanted to do MoCap. We also knew that some of our cinematics, the player character would be in the scene sitting there, and would be one of the characters in the scene and look around. So you're as a character in the scene, you're essentially 360 degrees, you can look any place you want while other characters in the scene are doing the cinematic script. What's also cool is that, of course, then there's no book. That's what I'm saying. We had to make it up. So we made it up pretty much trial and error. Like, well, I think this will work. What do you think? I don't know. Let's try it. So uh, trial and error, everything we did, um, the third thing was, what's interesting is that if you look at a camera in any movie, when you look at the camera, you've broken the fourth wall. Now, in VR, there is no fourth wall, really, because you're in the scene. So the characters actually are going to look at you, and that actually is amazing, because when a character looks at you in VR, you're like, oh gosh, they... They see me. I'm actually here. I'm in this scene. I'm actually Twine, the little, the kid, brother, sister, whatever, whatever you want, of Sky. And Sky is my older sister, and my father is sort of this big, mean, gruff guy. And, and they're periodically, these people look at me. So in order to do that, on the set, we had Jamie would actually take a position in the, on the set and be the person that will eventually be the player. And the actors did their scene, and every once in a while I would say, hey, this is a good time for you to just glance back and, and look at Twine. Instead of seeing a camera there or some bunch of ping pong balls that represent the player, 
they were actually seeing Jamie and they could look into his eyes. And then in the game itself, we have uh, eye tracking. So if you're in the game and you see somebody look at you and they're talking to you, you can move your head and they, their eyes track your eyes as you're moving around, which I didn't know. Is that going to be creepy? <laughs> it actually isn't creepy. It feels kind of cool. It feels like there's somebody actually there talking to you. So um, one of the first things we had to do was, um, and I'm trying to remember what the next thing is here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, this, this, you've seen stuff like this before. Here's... So, so real-time facial capture, um, and just to see, okay, this is going to work. This is how we need to do it. But we, what I wanted to do was, instead of just performance capture, which is getting everything all at the same time, we wanted to, like, and uh, trust me, on Halo and Destiny, we've done uh, mocap, we've done perf cap, we've done what we call face-over, where you've already finished everything, and then you just fake it and have somebody redo their face while they're listening to their voice. Um, this time we did it a little bit differently. We, um, first of all, we went to mocap now and Drew taped all the scenes color coded for each scene we were gonna do. Some things had uh, sets that we needed to put in there. And of course, with mocap, all you need is something that takes up a volume. You don't build real sets. Uh, this over here is the room where the face over or the facial capture plus voice capture happens at the same time. So what we decided to do was put the actors in their suits, build the sets, get them off book, rehearse this, get the best rehearsal, get the best take we could on video. And then we went in and chose the one we liked the best, had them redo the voice and face capture based on the best rehearsed uh, thing that we captured on video. Then we used that voiceover and facial capture. We knew that would be the face. And this was now the, the feeling of what the actors needed to do was in their bodies. So we went back out and played back in the studio the voice recording and watched the video up on a big screen if they needed reference. But they redid their bodies action based on listening to their own voice that they had just done. So that way we had really good, clean voice capture, facial capture, and then body capture. So it was a little bit tedious to do these three steps, but that's the way we did it. Um, oh yeah, this is kind of fun. This is, uh, you'll see this scene coming up here. This is the father, this is Twine sitting here. Uh, no, this is Sky. this is my sister. Well, in the game. And this is the wagon. So I don't know if you can see this in the darkness, but there's inner tubes here. So the camera is actually, we're getting camera uh, motion here based on the fact that this wagon is sitting on the inner, inner tubes. So when the player, when, the, when Sky walks on this, it actually moves a little bit. When we're pretending like the horse is drawing this, we're, we had somebody actually move the, the wagon just randomly a little bit. Um, and if you look at this shot here, there's Sky. This last little position of the father and Sky, um, you'll see the, the Pro Tools session where this movie shows up. There's Jamie. He's putting his head about in the position where the player's head will be. So when Sky needs to look at, at, at Twine, which is the name of your character, uh, she's got eyes to look at, which is cool. So he, the next thing after we did this, we got it roughed up. Now I'm having to do the normal thing, right? I have to sound design Foley and music and score and do all that stuff just with a normal movie in Pro Tools. So here's that. Next time, you stay home and take care of Twine. In a few years, when you're older, maybe- I'll be 17 this summer! scavenger in the village. Without me, you'd come home with an empty wagon. <laughs> <laughs> this is you right here. That's your empty head. So 
Um, what was interesting about that is like, okay, sure, that works. I hear horses, I hear ca uh, wagon, I hear them talking. Uh, what's missing, of course, is a whole bunch of stuff. We don't have any l outdoor ambience. We actually are moving this wagon through a real environment. So uh, Ian put in all sorts of great ambient sounds that you actually move through while you're in the wagon. Um, and of course, every sound that's been foleyed in here has to be emitted from where it's happening. So the horse sounds have to happen where the horse head is and his hooves have to have and down where his hooves are. And where there's a little flag flapping and there's wagon creaking, which is happening from several emitters. Uh, her footsteps are happening from where her feet are. Um, of course, their mouth, their head is what emitting their dialogue. And then I had, well, here's a good sound of just wagon wheel rolling. Well, there's four wagon wheels. So I, we, you I, I didn't think you'd have to do this, but you really do. There's, in the game, there's a wagon wheel there, 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 and there. Because as you sit there, you move your head around, and that stuff better be where it is, otherwise it just stops being real. And as soon as it's real, it just disappears. And you think, yeah, I'm in a wagon. So a lot of work just to make you in a wagon. Um, <laughs> This is fun. He's now the giant golem. He's playing back to her pre-recorded voice. Ooh. Now he's at least three times taller than she is, so we had to do this as a separate take. Stand up. Action. And this is our animator, Steve, Steve pretending <laughs> he's just placeholder. You should see her face right now, Mr. Here it comes. Don't be afraid. <laughs> I forgot. I can tell we're making this up as we go along. You're a little taller than Sky for the scene, but that's I think you're like <laughs> twice as far away from like everything's moving. Right? And there's yeah, Jamie. Well, and because this guy's so tall, Jamie has to put his head way down on the floor to be get the right perspective. For almost the whole thing. So then we have to we actually did a video reference of where the player would probably be when the golem walks into this scene. you with a big piece of vacuum cleaner. Action. That's the vacuum cleaner right there. It's a knob. <laughs> you should see your face right now, Mr. Blood. So this is the perspective you're going to be in the game. <laughs> I forgot what it's like to see your first goal. Mother gave this to me when I was And I am a girl. Golem stands up. Can you believe it? This is a spoiler alert. Some of the golems are bad. I already told you this. The siege is over. Yeah. So you can see how sound needs to make this real. All right, so here is the Foley session and some of the music for some of that scene. Right here, this is where the character, your twine character will be. Once again, no head, because this is where you're looking. And you can look 360 degrees any place you want. There's your sister. Here's the golem. So remember, Mother every sound you hear has to be local, come from an emitter in this scene someplace. Ooh, what happens next? I don't know. One of the other cool things about this is we actually, so in, in some of the early cutscenes, uh, cinematics, you sit in a position and you can look any place you want through 360 degrees, which means that every, every single sound has to be cut up, placed in an emitter, and triggered at the right time. Um, there is a, 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 there's some scenes later on where you actually can move wherever you want to move during a cutscene, which is, is very interesting. I won't talk about that because that actually is a spoiler. Um, 
Now, one thing, it's so funny listening to Brian uh, talk about the error of spatializing audio. Doing as many movies and games as I've done, there's a certain amount of cheating you can do. You just sort of like, well, ah, that, no one's going to notice that, right? I, I can cheat that. And so there's a scene where you're in bed because you've been hurt, and your father is talking to you, and he's right there looking right at you. So there's footstep sounds for him. There's a little candle sound over here. Um, you can look any place you want, but you can't move. Uh, he reaches down, picks up a crutch, and then gives you this crutch. So for me, that was Foley, meaning I was just, I needed to make sure I had footstep sounds for him. His dialogue came out of his head. And the Foley sounds, like his movement sounds, the sound of him sitting in his chair, uh, we just had all those sounds coming out of the, sort of the middle of his body. So he reaches down, picks up this crutch, and it's all coming out here. And then he reaches over and does this. Now you're sitting here, okay? So I swear this arc of error is exactly what you showed. Because as I watched the Foley sound, all the Foley comes from here, he's moving, and he places the crutch by reaching out. And the sound of the crutch hitting the bed and, the t and this little chest still sounded like it was coming from here. And when I, I didn't know that until I put everything into the engine and put the headphones on and put the uh, HMD on, head, head mono display, and everything was working great. Father moved, crutch was there, but I heard the crutch here. It was just about exactly that arc that you were saying. I, c I noticed that sound. So I had to take the crutch sound out of the middle of his body Foley emitter and stick it on its own emitter. So the crutch has its own emitter, so it goes like this. They may never hear what you say. I am so sorry. He's looking at us. Here, for when you're stronger. Or I can always carry you around on my shoulders, right? So the amazing thing was, I didn't, I thought for sure you could cheat that. that you saw that video, right? It didn't look like there was that much distance between where his body was and where the crutch ended up. But inside the environment, it was just enough of an angle where it stopped being real. And I thought, ah, who, who's ever going to notice that? Well, I couldn't live with myself. I had to, I had to cut it and redo it. So um, what's next? I think this is the opening cut scene, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to go into Ian's thing. So watch this scene. You Better have fallen off a cliff or something. Wait. Did you fall off a cliff? Twine! Here's the thing. Will HRTF really work and convince me? Well, I'm sitting here. We did this You're on purpose. You're supposed to be helping Paul load the wagon. I guess I should be too. She walks behind me. She's talking. I hear her footsteps. Now, I could actually it's twist so all the way around and try to see her, but that's, nobody wants to do that. They do the natural thing. And then she sits very close. Plus, it's nice to have music that I can put wherever I want. I miss mother too, but you can't keep running off like this. She wouldn't have wanted that. So that's not the final mix because the final, these are just the Foley and the chunks that I know need to be represented. What's really fun about this is her voice is far away because she's far away. So as she comes through space, she gets louder, she gets closer. Her footsteps are far away until they get closer. Um, uh, it, we, she's right next to you and we were sort of wondering what we don't even know what the distance is of like she's too close she's invading my personal space but we I think we guessed pretty good it feels pretty pretty nice so we d there's no book on this right we don't know if somebody's like right there you might go I don't want to play this game it's too much but this is actually pretty cool but once you do all of these things then of course then we do environment sounds and they're all around you and uh, the environment like the bird is over here, so when you move this way, he's over here. When you move this way, he's here. All that stuff works really, really well. 
because you're always moving your head and looking where you want to look. And sure enough, I had Brian come out to my house when I was working on this particular one because I'm like, Brian, I don't think HRTF is working. And so here's two people who have been in the game business a long time. And he's listening to it and he goes, I don't, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> so if both Brian and I weren't sure this, this shows you that there's a lot of, there's some distance to travel before this is like the matrix, okay? We finally, when we finally did get HRTF working and not just a simulated 7.1, which is what I had, at the, which was apparently what was going on at the time, you get some really great panning in 7.1, but you don't get real HRTF. Sure enough, she sounded like she was walking behind me. And I think Ian's going to show you this other thing, uh, which is a crystal uh, that you hold, and it, it's something that is very cool and localizes really nicely. And let's see. Oh, yeah. Here's just a sort of a fast movie of us setting up the sets, tearing them down, setting up new ones, tearing those down. There's the wagon. And here comes the bedroom with the stairs. <laughs> so that's all you need to have. You don't have to be fancy with your stuff. It just has to be correct for the environment you're building. So... Ian is going to talk a little bit more now about um, what it's like to work for me, <laughs> what it's like to do actual, create more audio in VR, and some of the things he learns. And I think he's probably learned, you'll see one of the very first thing he's learned from working with me. All right. How do I use this? There's All right, wait. I didn't practice with his, I practiced with mine. Um, so this is, uh, like Marty said, I'm an audio designer at Highwire Games. Uh, I do sound effects and implementation. And this is my little portion of the talk, three rules I thought I knew about VR audio and how I broke them, sticking with the rule of three. It wasn't planned, it just happened like that. Um, and then I also have a bit at the end, three new rules, if I may, for, three, for uh, VR audio. Okay, so rule number one. Uh, you're not supposed to use effects after you uh, after you render in binaural because that's going to mess up the the imaging, right? Um, and okay, that's a, actually I should before I say that, I actually think all of these rules are good rules for you to know. Uh, the point is not that they're bad rules and you shouldn't follow them, but uh, that you should be okay with breaking rules. And sometimes there's good reasons to break the rules. So. Um, it's true, you definitely don't want to put like a ping pong delay afterwards because then you're not going to be able to tear, tell where anything's coming from. But HRTF uh, has this tendency to make things quieter and we had a problem for a while uh, trying to get things loud enough and uh, um, tried a bunch of different things, they weren't working and I remember I was talking with Brian Schmidt who's like the star of today's show for some reason, well not for, we know why. But um, he gave me this advice, he's like well just try it, just try a limiter. So I did and it worked and things were louder didn't mess up the spatiali spatialization, so bada bing, bada boom, that one's done. All right, broken rule number two, uh, never bake in your reverb. And again, this one is true. Um, you wanna really work with dry samples and use the environment reverb and the attenuation so you don't mess up your, your distance cues. Um, but that doesn't mean you should never use it. I have two examples for this. First one is your big old sword or anything that's naturally reverberant. Um, this one's kind of a gotcha, but if you bang your sword really hard on something, uh, it's gonna reverberate, and so we bake in just a mono reverb into that and put that on the sword. So like, say you hit um, that golem right there. Uh, he's one of the smaller golems, they're scarier ones. Um, say you hit him and he screams out in pain and uh, you hit him really hard with your sword so it's ringing out a little, you swing through, uh, you still hear him screaming, screaming from there, and wherever you put your sword, you can hear it ringing around. It's a really cool effect. Uh, example number two is not that, but that is a cool screenshot. Um, <laughs> example number two, there's things that are never gonna be, I'm sorry camera people, I'm gonna be moving around a little bit, it's just my thing. Um, there's uh, things that are never gonna be close to you, uh, like bats in a cave, or birds off in the distance. And I have some really nice reverbs in my DAW, and I don't have as nice reverbs in Wise. Um, so it just sounds better, so you do it, right? You want the game to sound better. Um, and then along those lines, there's other things that like you may want them to be really close, but they just don't sound good in, uh, in the environment reverb. 
So an example of that is like uh, water drips or rocks falling. Um, like you might want to have a little dripping water that you can go right up next to, but I couldn't get it to sound good through the environment reverb. And so I just made the decision, put it through a nice reverb that makes it sound far away, and put it in a place where you can never get that close to it. Um, so never bake in reverb. X, no thank you. Uh, we broke that rule too. And then broken rule number three, insert sound here spatializes best. This is kind of a more in-depth one, which is why I say insert sound here. I actually have three examples of insert sound here. So the first one is the human voice. Again, it's true. The human voice actually spatializes really well. Um, in that scene that you saw earlier, uh, you, you put it on Skye's, what Skye is that character? You put it on Skye's head, she has her voice, she sounds far away, she goes behind you, it works. The going behind you part is really cool. Um, the acting is cool, the story is cool. But as far as like the, the sound quality of the voice, dialogue is king. You want to make it really interesting and you want to like, you know, focus on the dialogue. But it didn't really pop out as being really cool. It was just right. Um, so we did a couple things to add interest to it. Uh, one is really accentuate uh, the environment reverb, or we, we did, um, just a little bit. Uh, and so dialogue is never one of those things that you, you bake in reverb to, because VR is really good at being intimate. Uh, Sky, at, put, at times she's far away, and you get the, uh, the Sesame Street thing where she's yelling and there's more reverb. And she gets close, and in these nice intimate moments, you want to be able to suck away all the reverb and like have a really nice dry signal and hear the contrast. So if you if you're a little more you a little more emphasize the environment reverb, you can hear that effect more. Um, and we also do other things to add interest to it that aren't necessarily realistic. Like uh, uh, when she's yelling over that that cliff you saw in the thing, she goes twine. Uh, um, it wasn't in there because it's environment stuff, but. Um, she, uh, uh, we just put it through one of those slap back delays. Um, so you hear twine, twine, twine. It's kind of subtle, uh, and it's not realistic at all, but it sounds really cool. Um, so that's part A of broken rule three, broken. Uh, mono sound spatializes best. Again, true. I don't know any spatializer that works uh, with multi-channel sound other than dropping all channels but the first and then spatializing that correctly. Um, but there are instances we use multi-channel sound in VR, spatialized in the world. Um, one of those is, let's see, kind of a, um, uh, a typical use case of like 2D blend or spread, um, where you have something that's far away, you want it to sound point source, and when you get close, you want it to be a lot more wide. We have these insect clouds that you can actually walk inside. So when you walk inside of them, it goes full hard stereo, and you can hear them all around you and you hear movement, it's pretty cool. Um, there are some issues, uh, well there's like one little issue with that, with stereo in particular, in that um, if you have like kind of a virtual emitter sort of thing and they're right here and you turn 90 degrees this way, then you hear like a really close to mono image. Um, but that wasn't really a problem in this case because you, you, know, you walk in and you're like, whoa, this is cool, and you turn around and you walk away. Um, so you're never, you're never like, oh, walk in and turn 90 degrees and sit my head there for a second and listen. Um, if you did, though, it wouldn't sound right. Uh, let's see. Uh, I had a second example, but I did make a mistake. My presenter's notes are over there. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so one of my favorite parts in the game, uh, I forgot about it. One of my favorite parts in the game is you go underwater um, you take your golem underwater, uh, and that has no H, well, it does have some HRTF, but for the cool parts, it doesn't have any HRTF. Um, there's two parts to that that don't have HRTF that are really cool. There's the underwater ambience that's just around you, and then there's also the transition effects that cover up the crossfade. Um, so the underwater ambience just kind of didn't make sense to use HRTF in the first place. Uh, because HRTF is really good at externalizing sounds. And if you think about when you go underwater in a swimming pool, everything is like really up close and you feel really claustrophobic. Uh, so HRTF wasn't going to be good at that. Um, and also like speed of sound in water is something like four times faster than in air. So uh, the ITD would probably be messed up. But again, we're trying to forget the talk or forget the tech and hear what it sounds like. So I just found like a, a 
really cool stereo ambience. It sounds like you're underwater. Um, you know, like some sort of like slowed down hydrophone typical thing. It sounds really cool. Uh, Crossfade to that, no HRTF, whatever. Uh, it sounds really cool. Um, and then the transition effects. So you have like submerge transition and emerge transition. Um, you, like the emerge in particular, it's true for both of them, but I'll talk about the emerge. Um, you come out and you want to hear like some nice stereo effects of splashing on either side of you. Um, and I design, designed a cool sound for that. And um, Brian earlier mentioned that um, high frequencies get sucked out a lot of the time in HRTF. Um, and so those like nice crisp water drops um, all around you, they didn't really play very well. Um, it was HRTF, it sounded spatial, it didn't sound like really wrong, it just wasn't that cool. Uh, so, just did nice stereo recordings. Um, and it's the kind of effect where, you know, you go underwater and it's like maybe a two second effect. And so you can move your head and you'll hear some sort of movement, but it's, a, it's again like the bugs, you're never gonna have time to really go like, be like this and go, oh, that sounds mono, it sounds wrong. Sorry if I'm going off mic. Um, all right, so those were my two examples. Mono sound, uh, not always, the best use, and then this third one, I don't know what kind of time I have left. Cool, so it's rule of three, but I actually wanna talk about more than just real world sounds. I'm gonna roll some other stuff into real world sound. Um, so real world sound supposedly, supposedly spatializes better than a lot of other sounds. I just hit a button. Um, and that is true. That is true, um, for the most part, like the human voice, we already talked about that. And also, running water is a big one. It's like the survival-oriented sort of stuff. Uh, I've had to turn down the attenuation radii of running water a lot, because it really just grabs your attention before uh, other sounds. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, synthesized sounds don't spatialize well. Uh, so there's this dream ball and uh, you saw a little bit of it earlier. It's uh, when, usually when you see it, it's in this like dream void world. Um, and yeah, I'm making you work. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it, it spatializes really well. And I'm gonna try and guess why it spatializes really well. I think there's two reasons. One of them is, yeah, it's a really broadband sound. Uh, there's a lot of like crispiness in it. And, um, it's very zappy. Uh, but also non-sound reason, and I think there's a lot of non-sound reasons that thing that sounds can spatialize really well, um, is you're just really focused on it because in the world there's not much sonically going on, there's not much visually going on, um, and there's not much to do except for really focus on this dream ball and pay attention to it. So you, you're focusing on it, you expect it to have a sound coming from where it is, and it does, and it's kind of like the dialogue coming out of the center speaker effect at the movies where, you know, you have a character here and a character here and like the center speaker right here and both of their voices are coming out of that. But um, that's how they mix it in movies, right? Um, but you hear it coming out of their heads. So uh, I think it's because you're focusing on it. And then uh, also the broadband helps a lot. Um, this sound though, this is the, this is the dream stone. And it does. It also has a synthesized sound, but it's not really that broadband. It's kind of this warm choir pad-ish sound. And if you heard it on on its own, sorry, I don't have any audio examples. It's hard to do audio examples for VR. Um, but if you heard it on its own, you'd think it doesn't spatialize very well. Um, but it actually spatializes really well. And I think that is entirely because of focus. Uh, I'm calling it focus, not like the wise focus parameter or anything. It's just like your attention. Um, uh, so there's a couple things that we do in the game to encourage you to really focus on this Dreamstone. One of them is, yeah, like the Dream Void, it's kind of a boring environment. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not a boring environment, but compared to this thing that you're holding, it's like not as interesting. Um, it has a cone attenuation, um, which if you don't know what a cone attenuation is, it has like a, direction that the sound goes out and it changes, usually gets quieter outside of that direction. Um, and that's not really realistic at all, but it's, um, well, I mean, this is like a magical crystal spoon thing, so it's not really realistic, but uh, it, 
it's not realistic, but it's fun. Like you can manipulate it one to one, you know what's going on, and you kind of just want to play with it. And so it's encouraging you to focus your attention. And I think that really helps a lot. That's kind of, yeah. So I was going to talk a little bit about this before, but the, I, I was going to wait till we got to this. This is one of the most important things. It's actually an object in the game that you're holding. You see your hand, you see your arm. And it looks, it's basically the same exact size as a PlayStation Move controller. <laughs> with a little thing at the top, that's the crystal. And every time I'm checking to see how the spatialization is, what's, which I think is interesting, because once again, Brian Schmidt, who talks about everything before we do, um, <laughs> if you're looking at it and you're also, the motion that's happening is in your control completely. It's an object you're holding in your hand and you're looking at it in the game. And so when you move it, you know that you've moved it over here. So it, the HRTF and the spatialization works really well because your mind is in total sync with your arm. So I moved it over here, and it's now it's over here. I rotate my wrist just a little bit, and the cone continuation works. So every tiny move you make with this, above, behind, around, it just works. So I'm always testing it with my eyes closed in virtual reality to make sure that the sound actually is doing what I expect it to do. And we worked quite a while on it, and I think it's actually pretty cool. It's probably one of the coolest things we have. Other than on the sword, when you become the big golem with the sword, there's these little metal rings that have physics. And they, at first it was like, oh, the, the designer is like, we don't need to make those make sound. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they have to make sound. The first thing people are going to do is see that thing, and they're going to shake that. Mm -hmm. And if you see the rings move and you don't hear them going, chink, 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 you're going to be really depressed. Thankfully, they all work. So... Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that was it for real world sound spatial. Oh no, I, I actually had one more, but this is one of the non real world sounds. So um, uh, it's just another example of focus. Um, so we have the, some loot in our game. You can pick up. You kind of like hoover it up in a vacuum mode, um, Luigi style, and. You, what you can do is like the, the game is really focusing or encouraging you to focus on it. You have this really severe tunnel vision. You can only see through a little thing. And one of the only things you do in that mode is collect loot and everything else gets low passed. Um, and this sound, if you, if you cancel it and it falls to the ground, there's this little physics sound that happens. And it's nothing special. It's not broadband. It's not uh, a long looping sound where you can like reposition your ears and see where it is. It's kind of quiet, so it's, he actually told me to turn it up the other day. Um, and uh, and it's, it's uh, but when it hits the ground, just this little dink, it sounds like it's coming from exactly where it's coming from. And that's not like something we tried to do. It was a happy accident, but it works really well. And I was trying to think about why it works re really well. I think it's uh, non-audio reasons, dare I say. All right, so the three rules uh, that I thought I knew, they are all broken. Um, and we have time, right, for three new rules, I think. So rule number one, everything is a sandbox. Um, so like Marty said, the first time they get the sword, they see the rings, they want to play with it, right? And there's like golems off the, in the distance that you can fight in this whole city that you can explore, but the first thing you want to do is hit the rock and hear the sound and hit the tree next to you. Um, and even in a cutscene when you like traditionally don't really have that much agency, you have control over the camera. So like if you put interesting little things in the world, like the window behind you, and you you move, oh, there's a window behind me, and, and or like that candle, uh, like candles barely make any sound, but we have like a little fire sound with this really extreme attenuation where like the sound really changes a lot as you go, and it's not realistic but it's fun. Um, and so since everything is a sandbox and VR is just fun to play around in, just the more you can place those little subtle things to make it, to uh, emphasize that fun, I, I think that works really well. Uh, next one, everything has a velocity. I have spent so much time tweaking velocity curves for, for everything because like it's not like you have the A press A and you do the quick attack and it like can hit a couple things and at like three different speeds or something, right? Like I have a sword in my hand and there's like a tree in front of me and I can just like slightly tap it 
And why would you ever want to do that? I don't know, maybe because it's a sandbox and it's fun and you're just playing around. And you can also swing it really hard and like throw your controller across the room and break your stuff. Um, and in normal gameplay, like it's usually somewhere in between. But you can do any of that stuff. Um, and it's not just the sword, it's like, you know, you hit the tree and uh, like, just like when the sword, uh, you hit it really hard and you get more of a ring out from it, the tree you hit it really hard and like, it's not just a thunk from the, from the wood, you're hearing some of the trees rustle, maybe the leaves rustle, maybe for a little longer. Um, so everything, the most important sounds, the ones that you hear the most, ha have like velocity layers, just like a, a sampler. Um, and then uh, the, some of the less important sounds, they're just like kind of volume, but basically everything, especially physics stuff, it has uh, really finely tuned RTPC. So I just spent a lot of time on that, and it helps a lot. And once you get it right, like Marty says, you don't notice it. Um, and then the last one, this was my favorite. I really like doing environment sound on this project. Um, it's really hard, takes a lot of little tweaks. The, the most, let's see, the hardest part is portals, um, entrances uh, between two different environments. Um, and WISE now has the, the, the portals feature, which I'm super excited to try out, but Golem is on an earlier version and it doesn't have that, so we had to come up with our own solution. Um, so when you walk into a new area, imagine you're like in the portal and um, you know, you trigger a crossfade, it, it doesn't work. Because like a lot of times, at least me, when I'm playing, I like go to this new cool area and I'm like at the threshold, I'm like, whoa, this is cool. Where did I come from? And if you do it on a, on a timer, uh, just a crossfade, then you like, you're like hearing the stuff change around you and you're like still half in the house, but it sounds like you're outside and it just like completely breaks it. So what we ended up doing, um, I think it worked pretty well. It's a little finicky sometimes, uh, but works works well most of the time. Is uh, we have like environment A and environment B, and most of the sounds in the environment are three D emitters. But just in case I messed up at some time and you know there's no three D emitters around, we have this little room tone around you that's uh, attached to you. So you have environment room tone A and environment room tone B, and they're on a state in Wise, so like we, we hit state B and it does this crossfade, and at the same time there's an entrance emitter, or maybe a couple entrance emitters, um, and it's inversely tied to that state. So if you're in room A, it's playing room B ambience, but spatialized from the doorway or the portal. And as soon as you hit the trigger, they both crossfade, and, um, and now you're hearing in your head room B, and from the door you're hearing room A. Um, so that works pretty well most of the time. Uh, one other environment sound is difficult. I have to look at my presenter slides again. Oh yeah, um, so this is a pretty cool thing. Uh, the, the room tone I was talking about earlier, the non-3D, well, it is kind of 3D. Uh, this is kind of a popular thing to do in VR audio um, where you have like usually like a quad, a set of quads um, that have the location of the listener, but they have the world's rotation. Um, so what that means is like if I move around, they're gonna move with me. But if I rotate, like they're here, I rotate, they stay there. Um, and I think, so, so we have those. Uh, they're not quad though. Um, I think most people when they start looking into, into environment sound for VR audio, look into ambisonics. Um, and the ambisonics is really useful, but we didn't find it useful for our room tones. Uh, and that's just because there's not a lot of content for it, and it's not super malleable. I could use something like the ambisonics toolkit to make my own ambiences um, in ambisonics, and that is cool, uh, but it takes a bit of time, you know, and I've got a lot of ambiences to do, so just keep going. Um, so what did I look at next? I looked at like 5.1 and 7.1 ambience libraries, and it was kind of a similar story with those. Uh, not a lot of content, and it was also kind of expensive. Um, so I looked into Quad, and Quad worked pretty well. Um, 
at this point, I'm thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm making my own content for it. What can I do that's a good balance between uh, it spatializes well and is not a big hog on my time. Um, so at quad, it's only four channels. I can like probably cut up a stereo file and I don't know, use the last half as the back two speakers or something, right? So I tried that. Um, sounds pretty cool. Um, actually, I think I tried duplicating. I, I tried a couple different ways. Um, and it sounds pretty good, uh, but it has a little bit of a stereo problem where when you go like this, uh, you, get a, you get a mono sound field. Uh, with quad, it's just more mono, it's more center heavy. Um, and it wasn't that bad, but I thought we could do better. Um, so we ended up going with, the, the solution we went with in the end is like a trilateral speaker arrangement. Sorry. Um, so you have uh, three speakers, equidistant, on a circle, um, all like 120 degrees apart. So you have one here, one here, and one directly behind you. And they have world rotation, and uh, it's pretty simple to make the sounds. Uh, I like, if it's a 30 second ambience, I take 30 seconds of left and right channel of a stereo ambience, and then like 30 seconds of one of the, uh, those channels from not that part. Bring it in. And um, I was a little worried about the correlation at first. Like, is this going to sound like it's all the same thing? Um, and yeah, there's like correlation, obviously, between left and right in the back channel. Uh, didn't bother me. So it's good. Um, and then, as you can probably tell, when you turn around, you can never get to a point where things are like really trying to collapse inside. They're all pretty much the same angles around the room. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, three new rules for VR audio. And if I may, one more rule. Don't forget to break all the rules. All right, so that's uh, my part. Hand it back off to Marty. Thank you. So I'm just going to close it up. We've been having a lot of really good fun. And when Golem comes out, you should get it. It should have been out by now, but it's not because making uh, a VR game is actually really hard. We're working with PlayStation stuff, and we're working with Unreal stuff, and we're working with Wise stuff, and we're working with Physics stuff, and like, the only way you can tell how it all works is once you get the entire thing built and you put on the, all the accoutrements and get to actually see and hear what it's doing. And it's amazing how much it changes. We're starting to anticipate how it's gonna end up being as we, we get to that point, but it actually takes a lot of work to get to the point. So uh, this is Golem, we'll get it when it comes out, but if you really want to, and of course this is, I would never actually push anything, but Echoes of the First Dreamer is available now, so you can get it when, if you feel like it and want to hear some music, you can go right online and buy it. All right, thank you very much. We've got time for some questions, looks like Mr. Philip Clausen has a question, or are you just stretching? Oh, he does, okay. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about uh, reference. So you mentioned a little bit uh, about moving and testing the sound with your eyes closed, Marty, mm -hmm. when you're moving that thing around your head, it's really cool. Um, because with VR, so maybe, what could, like, maybe just better, is, do you ever close your eyes for reference checking your spatialization, and then do you have another standardized thing in your game to say, okay, this is what I want my 3D reference to, like, this is what I want 3D to sound like. Do you take the headphones off and tell Ian to clap, or? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny, to, to, in order to make this all work, those of you know how these things work, you actually have to have the headset on, and then you put the headphones on. It's actually, I mean, VR is kind of clunky right now, but it's, it's really compelling. So it's actually weird to put all this on and then close your eyes. <laughs> but uh, that's what audio guys do. So um, every once in a while, like uh, by closing my eyes, if, if it's, and, and I'll go to Ian and I'll say, uh, yeah, those guys need, I need, I'm not getting enough occlusion obstruction on them. I, I hear them and they seem like they're all around me and I wanna hear them like when they're over there, I wanna know they're there. Vertic verticality is really tough, but if you see some golem go up the stairs and then he goes behind a wall, you want all that to work with occlusion and, and it, you feel like he's above you because you saw him go up there. So um, 
but closing your eyes and trying to imagine what's going on is a really good test. One of the other cool things is some of these golems actually throw these spears at you, and of course, they when they go and they hit behind you, and you can whack them out of the air as they're coming at you. And those actually spatialize pretty well. We, we've got them nice, tight mono loops that, that go past you, and, and you, you can tell where those spears are. So you can, it's possible to actually keep your eyes closed and dodge the spears, which is it's a game into itself. Yeah, there's actually, uh, it, there's, there's a couple levels that I, I do a lot of the environments on that I can walk through now with my eyes closed and I can get to the end of the levels like the catacombs. Mm -hmm. yeah, be, just, I, don't, I don't think it's anything I did, I think it's VR. But yeah, with, with all those 3D sounds, you can sometimes just close your eyes and walk right through it and know where you are. So have you found there's any issues with music being in a VR space, but it's not diegetic in the world. It's just part of the emotion that you're trying to deliver. Yeah, so I, I think this is why I say st music still makes you feel. So music makes you feel it's not part of your reality, and neither is narration, right? So I've made the aesthetic choice, and we'll see whether people like it or not. But to me, music should just be right here. It's like where music is in movies and TV and other games. Music, if music starts moving, like if the, you know, I have this nice, you know, beautiful stereo image and the, you know, strings are over here and then I'm actually in the game and I look there and the strings are still there, I'm gonna go, okay, where are the string players? They're in this world. So, and if I have a narration and I put, somehow have that also where my, if the narration moves as I move my head or the narration stays in a physical spot, that, that doesn't work either. So. I don't think anybody's going to question when they are looking around and they hear the birds, you know, stay pinned to the environment and they hear footsteps behind her and they hear dialogue, but the music just is there. I don't think anybody's gonna go, gee, why isn't the music, why isn't there an orchestra in this environment? I think that nobody will question that. So that's, that's the decision I made. I think it works, uh, we'll see. Uh, any more questions for Marty or Ian? There we go, Drew. Uh, so, did you try different binaural engines, and which one did you settle on? Um, whatever the binaural engine is that comes with Wise, or is it it's Sony? It's Sony's. Yeah, yeah. since we're using uh, uh, PlayStation, it's really limited. It's the Sony proprietary tools, or I think you can use Aro headphones. But yeah, we're using the Sony proprietary tools, which, by the way, like have no controls. It's like on. It's Actually, if, if anybody here broken. knows how to turn the volume up on the Sony, on the HMD, like, I'm not kidding, you plug the headphones in, you turn it up all the way, and I'm like, nah, this isn't, as l I want to go so loud that it hurts my ears, so I turn it down a little bit. Like, you know, I like running at seven and a half or eight, but I'm, I have to go all the way to 10 to get it loud enough in the headphones. So, uh, does anybody know how to, do you? Said a lot of that depends on the impedance of the headphones. Well, it doesn't matter. I have Sony headphones, and then I also use the earbuds Sony gives me, and then we have so nice other so kind of headphones. So they ship headphones with the They HMD. ship headphones with it. it well, it, that's it. something I think that they should look at. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's like uh, giving dynamic range to, or, or some range to the convolution, so the, all the F HRTFs, you know, have these curves and how it sums and all that. So they're they're making sure it doesn't distort. But that's now, not their decision. But now it like pulls Brian, everything down because Brian been, knows this back in yeah. the Xbox days. It's like, I've, don't you tell me what the ceiling is. Yeah, I'll put totally. one on. <laughs> I had the same issue when I was doing um, you know 360 video uh, audio and um, on a title. And yeah, it just like I I had to just pull it down and I didn't know where it was going to clip. But it, we were on. Uh, Gear VR at the time, so yeah, it was just like uh, yeah, I, I don't know what they've done. It was done. a weird I ceiling; I couldn't see it. Yes, you know, like I, I, they, they I just want to see where me. the ceiling is, and I want to say, okay, let me go as close to the edge as possible, and and if if, if I 
if we get into distortion territory, like I'll take the blame. But don't suppress it for the lowest common denominator and make it so we can't make things pop. This is why we had to put some compression limiting at the, the very end of the chain, just so we get something that feels louder. Right, I see an Oroban binaural meter coming soon. I hope so. <laughs> of course, you could also run the headphone jack into an amplifier and turn it up, which is something we're doing, but most people won't. Ian, when you made the decision to go with the three sources on the ambience. See, rule of three, it worked, it was yeah, great. Really. <laughs> Where did you make that change? Did Wise do that or did you do that in the engine? Yeah, uh, here, I'll come out here so you can see me a little better, sorry, Max. Um, so that's in Wise using user-defined positioning. Um, you can just uh, set, uh, you know, on a 2D, well actually in a 3D space, um, it's in the positioning tab, you do 3D sound, but instead of doing game define, you do user define, and then you uncheck uh, follow listener orientation. Sounds pretty clean. What defines the three points? Uh, so the um, origin point in that volume in Wise is the listener, and then you have th these things called paths where you can, like, if you have a bird flying, you can say, okay, it's going to start here, and at five seconds it's going to be here, and it's going to lerp between them. Um, and I just don't set a path. I just set a point. And, and the other thing about this particular thing is that we're still relying mostly on emitters in the environment. So as you walk past things, or things are really doing stuff. But what I wanted to make sure was that you could never get to a spot in the game where suddenly sound just sort of disappeared, which happens a lot. Sometimes it's just like, you want to have some bass sound that just covers everything. But because it's VR, it can't be as static as I used, you know, got away with in other games. So this was, I think, a really good solution. We know everything's covered with something interesting, but not super interesting. Most of the interest comes from the point sounds. Yeah, that's one thing you told me was make it so that when I turn my head that I can hear that I'm turning my head. Yeah. But otherwise, don't call attention to it. Yeah, like so even in the opening thing that you see, you're in this void, and it's basically a stereo thing, but it's spatialized enough so that when you turn your head in the void, th you hear things around you, but there's never anything that you're going to pinpoint and look at it and just decide it's there. You're just in this void, which then allows the dream ball that is truly m the star of that scene like you, all you want to do is follow where the dream ball is and it comes around you and you hear it in this space. But the void itself is just interesting enough that it changes as you turn your head, but not specific enough that you can localize anything. Pinpoint. Any, any more questions for Marty or Ian? Well, uh, another hand for our guests, uh, fabulous guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian.